I'm here with biologist Amy Chan, who is here to talk about Burkholderia pseudomelae and the disease that it causes. Meloidosis, we've asked people to ask Amy about what they want to know about this bacteria. Let's roll the first question. Hi Amy, my name is Andrew. What is Burkholderia pseudomelae? That is a good question, Andrew. Burkholderia pseudomelae is a bacteria that is found in soils and water throughout the world, but is more of an epidemic and is more commonly found in tropical areas such as Northern Australia and Southeast Asia. It is a bacteria that causes a very infectious disease known as meliodosis, which can also be referred to as Whitmore's disease. What are some unique characteristics of the bacteria? There are many unique characteristics of Burkholderia pseudomelae. It is a small, aerobic, gram-negative, rod-shaped saffotroph. A saffotroph is an organism that feeds on or derives nourishment from decaying organic matter. Since it is aerobic, it relates to, involves, or requires free oxygen. Also, if you did not know what gram-negative means, it means that the bacteria do not retain the crystal violet stain that is used in gram-staining method of bacterial differentiation. Another characteristic of Burkholderia pseudomelae is that it is a facilitative intracellular pathogen, which means that it is a mycoparasite that is capable of growing and reproducing inside the cells of a host. It has the ability to invade and replicate inside various cells, including microphages, polymorphonuclear nucleocytes, and some epithelial cell lines, which aids in the pathogenesis of the bacteria. Pathogenesis is the manner of the development of a disease. What about the disease that it causes? Does that have any unique characteristics as well? Meliodosis, the disease that is caused by Burkholder pseudomoly, also has many characteristics of its own. For example, it is a free bowel illness, which means that a rapid onset of fever and symptoms such as headaches, chills, or muscles and joint pains can occur. It is an extremely infectious disease and can be transmitted in many different ways. Victims of this disease can experience acute pain, which is sudden onset and is usually the result of a clearly defined cause such as an injury, and is resolved with the healing of its underlying cause, and chronic pain, which persists for weeks or months and is usually associated with an underlying condition. It is the most endemic in tropical areas such as Southeast Asia and Northern Australia. What are some similarities and differences between a pathogen cell and a healthy cell? There are many similarities and differences between a pathogen cell and a healthy body cell. First, healthy host cells have a structured cytoskeleton. A cytoskeleton provides support in a cell. It is a network of protein fibers supporting cell shape and anchoring organelles within the cell. Host cells can reproduce properly and communicate with other cells through chemical signals. They have the ability to differentiate or develop into specialized cells, self-destruct when they become damaged or diseased, and have a normally structured cytoskeleton. On the other hand, a pathogen cell has the ability to form a lamellipodia. Lamellipodia is a cytoskeletal protein actin projection on the leading edge of the cell. Actin is a protein that forms the contractile filaments of muscle cells. The pathogen cell also contains an activated amoeboid, which is the most common mode of locomotion in eukaryotic cells. It is a crawling-like type of movement accomplished by protrusion in the, of the cytoplasm of the cell. These pseudomoly infected disease infected cells form multinucleated giant cells, exhibit intracellular motility based on actin polymerization and flagella, and is able to induce the fusion of nucleocytes during bacteremia. A multinucleated giant cell is a mass formed by the union of several distinct cells. Although they have although they all have these differences, they also have many similarities as well. Both of the cell types have DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, a self-replicating material present in nearly all living organisms as the main constituent of chromosomes and is the carrier of genetic information. I have a question. How does the pathogen enter, multiply, and target the body? The cell is able to escape into the cytosol, invade fib fibroblast and keratin sites, form cell membrane protrusions, exhibit intracellular motility, exhibit prolonged intracellular survival, and infect every organism, organ system in the body. Cytosol is the aqueous component of the cytoplasm of a cell, within which various organelles and particles are suspended. 
A fibroblast is a cell in connective tissue that produces collagen and other fibers. Keratinocytes are an epidermal cell that produces keratin. Intracellular motility is based on two distinct systems of motility supporting polymer, actin filaments and microtubules. Microtubules is a microscopic tubular structure present in, numer in numbers in the cytoplasm of cells. Once inside the cell, the bacteria can form cell membrane protrusions and can spread directly from cell to cell. It is spread through ingestion or con contact of bacteria onto open skin wounds or through the inhalation of aerosolized or cold air pseudomoly. How does the body attempt to maintain homostasis and what is the feedback mechanism that it uses? To maintain homeostasis, the white blood cells in the body work hard to kill the infected cells so that the body can return to normal. White blood cells are a part of the body's immune system. They help the body fight infection and other diseases. The white blood cells in the body work hard to kill the infected cells so that the body can return to normal. The body also develops a fever and starts to cough to get rid of the bacteria in the body. It is a positive feedback mechanism because the disease causes white blood cells to generate, which creates more and more white blood cells to help maintain homeostasis. How would someone be able to treat and prevent the disease that is caused by the bacteria? To treat meliodosis, doctors use a two-phase approach to stop relapse from occurring. The type of infection and the course of treatment will impact long-term outcome. Treatment consists of intravenous therapy and oral antimicrobial therapy. Treatment generally starts with intravenous, which means within a vein, antimicrobial therapy for 14 days, followed by three to six months of oral antimicrobial therapy. The cost of optimal phase one and two therapy imposes several restraints and is a likely contributor to unsuccessful clinical outcomes. Also, application of an aggressive two-phase approach to treatment reduces the risk of relapse occurring. Currently, there is no vaccine available for human use. To prevent from getting this disease, people must be cautious and when working in soil or water, wear waterproof boots and gloves to prevent the bacteria from getting into the body. Also, when treating the already infected, the doctors and nurses must wear protective clothing and get tested regularly for meliodosis. What is the plan that can help with this disease if we're to ever have an outbreak in my community? Some steps that a community can do to prevent or treat an outbreak in the community is to 1. Quarantine the people already affected by meliodosis to limit the spread of human-to-human -human infection. 2. Make the water and lands that have been proven to have a risk of meliodosis to be off-limits and a do-not-enter area. 3. Limit the time outdoors after a heavy rainfall, typhoon, monsoon, or flooding to limit contraction through water. 4. When working in soil or water, wear waterproof boots and gloves to prevent the bacteria from getting into the body. 5. Make finding a vaccine for meliodosis a priority for doctors and scientists, and have a test to make sure that what they are working with does not accidentally infect the public. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much.